Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. So really, our, our reliance on money is a more recent uh, phenomenon. And my reaction was, thank God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the jails will be less full. And that's just a good thing for everyone. In 2021, Illinois state lawmakers approved the Safety Act, a piece of criminal justice reform legislation that included a provision to eliminate cash bail as a pretrial condition. Cash bail was supposed to end in January 2023, but the provision was stayed by the Illinois Supreme Court hours before the law was to go into effect. The high court's ruling came after a Kankakee County Circuit Court judge ruled that the elimination of cash bail in the state was an overreach by lawmakers and that it was unconstitutional. On Tuesday, the state of Illinois' highest court issued its decision and ruled that cash bail is, indeed, constitutional. Here to discuss that ruling and what's ahead, we have Marie Franklin, community organizer, former law enforcement officer, and former network coordinator for Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice. That's the group behind the push for that cash bill elimination provision to be added to the Safety Act. Marie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And we also have Alexa Van Brunt, Director of the MacArthur Justice Center's Illinois office. Welcome back, Alexa. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Yes. Hi, Alexa. Hi, Marie. <laughs> now, Alexa, remind us, when we talk about ending cash bail, what exactly do we mean by that? Yeah, what we mean is that when people are charged with a crime, uh, before they go to trial, well before uh, they're convicted of anything, uh, judges in the past would order somebody detained, locked up on a cash bail. And so for them to get out, they had to pay a certain amount of money, often thousands of dollars. And if they couldn't pay that amount, they stayed in jail throughout their pretrial term, even if that was, you know, as is common in Cook County, for many years. So they were sitting in jail despite being presumed innocent under our system of uh, our system of criminal law. Mm -hmm. Now judges can't do that. Now they cannot use cash or economic means to detain someone. If uh, the state wants somebody detained pre-trial, they have to satisfy really specific evidentiary standards, mm -hmm. and the economic issue is taken out of the equation altogether, or should be. Right. Now the Illinois Supreme Court decided to overturn a ruling from an Illinois judge last December. We talked about that in the introduction, that a new state law to end cash bail was unconstitutional. Now, on right. what grounds was it found to be constitutional? So the, the lower court had focused on this provision of the Illinois Constitution uh, in Article 8, which says that all persons shall be bailable by sufficient sureties, except those held for capital offenses. And the what happened was the trial court said that clause means that there has to, has to be cash bail. They assumed that this kind of wonky term, sufficient sureties, meant cash, mm -hmm. essentially, money. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's a misreading of the Constitution. That just uh, a surety is just something to assure the person comes back to court. And that doesn't have to be money. Uh, it can be any number of things. Mm -hmm. And that really looking at legislative history and our constitutional history in Illinois, money bail was not something that was originally in place when the first constitutions were passed. That was not really uh, a known practice. So really our, our reliance on money is a more recent a phenomenon. And so doing this kind of legislative, historical, and textual analysis, the, the Illinois Supreme Court said that the trial court had it wrong. Okay. 
And Elaine, just let me let me jump in here and add that, you know, the fact that you would use money in such an important decision as this about taking someone's liberty away is just rude. No. <laughs> you know, why? You know, who, who thought that was the thing to do? And, you know, to, you know, to uh, balance our criminal justice system on the backs of poor people and black and brown people that we know that this system has done undue harm was Thank God, you know, <laughs> that we are finally moving in a direction that we should be moving in with this system. You know, this system, if you look at it historically, if you look at it uh, data wise, has been harmful to black and brown and poor people from the get go. So to be moving this system forward to where it is, uh, I'd like to use the term, you know, it was criminal and it was just us, you know, to move it to something fair. You know, that's why it's called the Pretrial Fairness Act, mm -hmm. so that it was it's fair to all people. And I am just appalled at those who would uh, challenge this. I, you know, one of the... Uh, state's attorneys in Madison County, he said, oh, but, th you know, this is the way we've always done it, and this system works for us. And I wanted to ask him, bro, who is us? Yeah. <laughs> That's always the question to ask, right? Now, Alexa, there are a number of exceptions to, uh, or for, that is, pretrial release. This right. does not mean everyone walking free until their trial date. So what are some of those exceptions? Right. And I think the biggies um, are the issue of a threat and the issue of a willful flight. So the reason that anybody has uh, a bail system in our country and most countries is just to make sure the person shows up for trial and doesn't commit any offenses while they're out on release, while their trial is going on. So right now, uh, a state's attorney can say that this person is a real and present threat to someone or the community and they should be held pretrial and then they can put on evidence to make that showing and the judge needs to find by clear and convincing evidence that the person is a threat. They can also put on evidence of willful flight. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those are the real biggies. Those are, those are the uh, times when the state um, can say that somebody should be held pretrial. But otherwise, this act has in it a presumption of release, which is how it should be. Mm -hmm. Now, Marie, the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police State Lodge President, Chris Southwood, says that the elimination of cash bail will put dangerous criminals back on the street instead of keeping them in jail or forcing them to post cash bail as they await trial. Many of those offenders will commit crimes again within hours of their release. And who will have to arrest those offenders again and again? The police officers whose jobs have been made immeasurably more difficult by all of the new anti-law enforcement measures that are in place. And that is a quote. Mm. Marie, you're, you're former law enforcement, yes. right? And you argued that eliminating cash bail system will actually make communities safer and more stable. How is that the case? So currently, when someone is arrested and they are held pretrial, they, you know, they, they lose their jobs, they lose their uh, living places, and some people have even lost custody of their children. Or the whole family is, is uprooted and upended because they're trying to decide, okay, are we going to pay rent this month or buy food this month, or are we going to get dad out of jail so that he can you know participate in his own defense? So this elimination of that, that option keeps families from being upended and and traumatized basically you know because of this system so you know i i take a I'm offended by his thoughts that, you know, this is putting more people in danger because that is just not what the facts say. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to ask him, have you read the bill, sir? <laughs> Do you really know what it says? Yeah. Because this will keep our communities stable, keep people at their jobs, keep people taking care of their children while they go through this process of having to defend themselves for some accusation, which is what this country was built on. So to take that away from a group of people, mm -hmm. you know, let's be real, 
you know, take it away from black and brown people, you know, is 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 atrocious. And, you know, it's it's about time that we call this thing a thing and that we eradicate this harm that has been done to black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. And this is a harm that you saw firsthand when you were a law enforcement officer? Oh, absolutely. I can recall one, one, you know, and it just sticks in my mind after all these years that I stopped a guy for speeding on 255 in St. Clair County. He had an arrest warrant because he didn't turn in a Blockbuster video. For those young folks out there, we used to go to the store called Blockbuster, <laughs> <laughs> get a video, get the movie, take it home, watch it, and then turn it back in. Well, he didn't turn his video back in, and they went through the process and ended up having a warrant for his arrest. And so, and there was nothing I could do. He had to be arrested. He had his child in the car with him. Mm -hmm. He had to try to call someone to come get his child. He needed $500 to get out, which he did not have. And so he was stuck in jail, all about a blockbuster video. So this theory that, you know, this is the purge law and the doors of the prisons are gonna open and everybody's just gonna be running amok is just is 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 just fear mongering, and it and it and it makes me angry, yeah. because I know that it is uh, targeted to certain people, so that they will feel fearful and try to keep people you know incarcerated pretrial, and and it's just it's it's not right. It's just mm -hmm. not right, and I would encourage people to please you know I would uh, encourage you. Read the law for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. and I know it's got a lot of legalese in there and it took me all day just to read the ruling that the Supreme Court gave. Yeah. But read it for yourself. Ask questions about how this thing really works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and be be uh, grateful that, you know, it may not be your community these things are affected, but I always think about that uh, poem Whoopi Goldberg used to say, you know, they came for the Jews and I didn't say anything because I wasn't Jewish. They came for gay people and I didn't say anything because I wasn't gay. Well, then when they came for me, nobody was left to speak. Mm -hmm. So let's speak up for everybody. So make sure that this is fair. This system is fair for everybody. And this is just the beginning. Right. We're speaking now uh, with Marie Franklin, a community organizer, former law enforcement officer, and former network coordinator for Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice, and Alexa Van Brunt, director of the MacArthur Justice Center's Illinois office. And we're talking about the law that will eliminate cash bail in Illinois starting in mid-September. Now, the Illinois Supreme Court ruling gives courts two months to prepare for the shift to end cash bail in mid-September. It's just a couple months away, mm -hmm. a, a month and a half. Yes. Chief Circuit Court Judge Andrew Gleason told us this is akin to turning the Titanic. The number of employees and amount of physical space in the courthouse are two challenges facing courts in St. Clair County. He's particularly concerned about how this will affect the public defender's, uh, de the public defender's office's caseload, and he sees the need for additional staffing. The, the practice now is people post a bond uh, on many of the charges, and the private lawyers are willing to take what's called a bond assignment for payment, and that's no longer going to be available, which means that when you're talking about a felony and people uh, facing jail time, they're entitled to a lawyer. So we're going to have to provide that. And a lot of the, I don't want to say a lot, but a significant amount of the slack was picked up by private lawyers who were willing to take a bond assignment uh, on these cases. Well, those bond assignments won't exist anymore. So those cases, it would it would be our prediction, and I think it's a pretty fair uh, prediction that a great number of those will now have to be uh, handled by the public defender's office, which will be a significant increase in their caseloads that are already, uh, they really are tapped out where they are right now. Judge Gleason adds that he sees some benefits, or he sees some of the benefits, that is, to ending the cash bail practice. There are, there are iniquities in the system that need to be addressed. Uh, hopefully this law will go in, in that direction to help us uh, make sure that we're giving a fair and equal playing field to all people who come before the courts. Uh, and, uh, and 
and we'll eventually get there. Uh, it will, we'll, it, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's going to take everybody, all hands on deck. I, I think of right now, uh, we're all going to have to, to bind together and, 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 uh, help each other out. But I think ultimately we'll look back on this and think we, we were up to the challenge. And on the idea that ending cash bail could lead to lawlessness and put dangerous criminals back on the street, a primary concern of opponents of this law, Judge Andrew Gleason says he's confident in his ability to hold a person awaiting trial if need be. If we find that somebody's a danger uh, to the community uh, at large, we, the judges and the state's attorney would file a petition and the judges still have discretion to hold those people, even though they're not uh, posting, you know, that, that we're, we're not giving them a bond amount. So those that we deem to be dangerous to the community will still be held in jail. Now, Alexa, from where you sit, are there other things that Illinois' justice system will face in gearing up for the implementation of the law? Or, you know, is there one thing among those that Gleason mentioned that stands out as the most immediately challenging? I think it, uh, Judge Gleason hit the nail on the head when he mentioned our indigent system of public defense. I think that is a glaring problem now. We just haven't dealt with it or really been forced to face the extent of it. And so when uh, the judge mentioned, and it's, it's what I found as well, that many people use bond money to pay for private lawyers in Southern Illinois, that's absolutely true, and that's a travesty. We should not be, uh, there's a right to state-funded counsel if you can't afford to pay for one. So it's the state's obligation to provide that counsel. And right now, a lot of public defenders and throughout Illinois are working part-time, and they have massive caseloads. And it's really an indigent defense uh, crisis. And I know Missouri's faced its own crisis in this, in this area. So right away, what has to be first and foremost on all of our radar, all advocates' radar, is bolstering the public defense system. Mm -hmm. And that means not depending on a cash bail system that's inherently cruel and unconstitutional to prop up the system of public defense to which people are entitled, mm -hmm. which means getting more public defenders, which means getting more resources to those public defenders to have uh, to bear in these pretrial detention hearings. It really means we have to drill down and fix a system that's been broken for some time. Right. Now, at what point will we start to see the effects of eliminating cash bail as a pretrial condition you know, and whether it's working as intended? Yeah, I, I think um, you can look to other states that have tremendously cut down on their use of cash bail. New Jersey is one of them, New Mexico. Uh, D.C. hasn't had cash bail uh, in uh, significant use for a long time. But New Jersey, you know, we're starting to see the results out of uh, their bail reform, and they've been overwhelmingly positive. They've seen significant decreases in pretrial incarceration. That'll be a really important measure. The jails will be less full. And that's just a good thing for everyone, for taxpayers, for the people who are locked up, to Maria's point, uh, for, for everyone. We'll also see, uh, I know people will be looking for this, especially the critics of, of this bill, what um, re-arrest rates look like, what rates of serious offense commissions are, uh, what court appearance rates look like. And in New Jersey, the answer is they look good. Court appearance rates have actually improved since the implementation of bail reform. And the number of people re-arrested re on serious offenses is really small. Uh, in 2020, I think it was something like 1.2%, uh, which was lower than the year bail reform was enacted. Uh, so those are the measures people are going to be looking to, and rightly so. And we believe, based on other statistical evidence, that it's going to show positive effects for public safety and for community well-being. Thank you so much to both of you. Alexa Van Brunt is director of the MacArthur Justice Center's Illinois office, and Marie Franklin is a community organizer, former law enforcement officer, and former network coordinator for Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice. Hope to hear from you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. 
This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury, with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.